Hi everyone, we're at week 11 and we're at that last little run towards the end of the course. We have a couple of important things to do in the last two weeks. This week we're going to look at feedback and the importance of feedback, both as someone who gives feedback and receives feedback, and we're going to have an exercise where you well, work with a partner and you give each other feedback on the draft of your paper. And then next week we're going to look at the reflective process by which you have a look at what you've learnt in this subject and you set some goals for learning in the future because just like learning how to write, um, learning how to research is not a matter of something that it's d done and dusted once you've learned it once, it's a lifetime of improvement. So it's very important that next week we look at, well, where are you going to go from this? What do you want to focus on? What are the areas in which you're going to uh, improve as you go? All right, so we're in the last run towards the end of term. And this is, of course, an area where it's easy to make mistakes. And it's an area where all the good work that you've been doing this term and staying up to date and, st and, keep and getting prepared can potentially fall down by um, a failure of uh, time and planning, particularly because the uh, you'll, you'll have a lot of other assignments that are due at the same time, and you'll need to be able to balance those in your preparation for exams. So it does really reinforce the importance of that, that idea of clear planning, and also that process of having work completed early enough to get adequate time to edit and to get feedback on your work. Now I know a lot of people have got into very bad habits about submitting work and completing work right at the last minute before submission and I think you know from what I've said before that that is not only setting yourself up to perform in a way that's well below your abilities but it's also a way of reinforcing bad habits that are going to cost you in the long term in your professional life particularly in the area of stress and we've spoken briefly about the issues of uh, mental illness, uh, depression, anxiety in the in the profession and that's while I would say not necessarily caused by bad time planning certainly bad planning and uh, time planning doesn't help and a lot of people who can get their way through uni on being coffee achievers and leaving everything to the last minute and doing anything in a mad panic will find in their professional lives that that is going to um, serve them very, very badly and end up in a bad situation. So we like to reinforce really good habits here and to start thinking about doing things the right way. Not because, you know, some abstract person is nagging us and telling us to do the right thing, but because we're taking care of ourselves and we're taking care of our own health uh, and well-being as part of what we're doing. Alrighty, so the core activity this week is finding someone to swap your paper with and uh, you, you give them feedback, they give you feedback and you give a copy of the feedback that you have written, you put a copy of that into your portfolio. So I don't care so much about the feedback you've received, I'm interested in the feedback that you've given because the process of giving feedback is actually an excellent way to improve your own skills. It's not just a matter of being nice to someone else and, and saying, well, here you go, I've helped you out and given you some assistance. It's actually about the process of what you learn through that, through that process. And uh, certainly uh, it's for most people when they get put into a position where they have to start overseeing the work of others, it really brings home not only what are the common mistakes in the field, but common mistakes that you make yourself that you might not notice in your own work, but you'll certainly notice in the work of others. All right, so that's the second last artifact for your portfolio. It's probably a good point to reiterate that the purpose of the portfolio is not to provide you with work that's that's too challenging in each piece. Um, it should be, if you've been steadily working through the term and you've been putting things in your portfolio every week, it should be reasonably easy to do fairly well in the portfolio subject. Um, and the, 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 sorry, the portfolio assessment task. Portfolio subjects are a completely different thing. But in the um, in the assessment, the research portfolio assessment task, it should be relatively easy to score quite well just by keeping up with the work each week and putting something in there. And that's a deliberate design design decision to do that. Uh, to reward people who have been keeping up with their work and have been developing those good habits. Now, of course, you could always do better, but on a 20% assessment task, 
the extra work you have to put in to polish something up to get a, a couple more grades, I think you're probably better spending that time focusing on your 60% assessment task if it comes down to it. So by all means, you know, make sure you're putting in the best work you have, but don't spend ages and ages and hours and hours obsessing and focusing on trying to get those each element of those elements perfect because you may get an extra mark or an extra mark and a half out of doing that but that time may actually get you another six marks or another ten marks of effort towards that final pa paper so but by no means am I saying ignore the research portfolio or be slapdash about it but what I'm saying about it is don't stress about it um, from my past experiences most people who've put in the work generally get sort of around the 12 to 14 mark just by putting the work in and then the extra few marks that, 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 that bump up from there and we're talking a, a couple of percent are from the people who have shown better insight, better um, analysis uh, and, and clearly better skills along the way. But it's not a case of of saying, oh, someone someone has spent hours perfectly crafting this and, and, and developing a lot of extra materials, so I'll, you know they're the ones who get the higher grades. It's really um, it's 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 really a matter of being very careful where you apply that work. Anyway, so that's the task. Um, a few comments on the process and the nature of the the task here. First of all, remember that proofreading and feedback are not necessarily the same thing. So we're not expecting you to proofread someone else's work and give them comments on their referencing, their grammar, their expression, their spelling, and all those things. And by all means, if you see something, put a note in there. But don't feel pressured that you have to go through line by line and say that that grammar is wrong or that word is wrong. Because these are two different tasks and they are two different skill sets. And some people you know, are better at one or the other. If you're lucky, you find the occasional person who's really good at both. But in my experience, people tend to be one or the other. So it's worth getting feedback from someone who can give you the big picture, can help you understand how your ideas, your expression, all that stuff comes together. But also find someone, and this doesn't even necessarily need to be a law person, who's good at the proofreading, who can, who can say, you, this, this word is the wrong word. And those are things that are very easy to miss, particularly in your own writing, because you read often what you intended to put down, not what you actually put down. So it is worth having someone, even a friend or a relative, who's good at proofing, who can um, go through that and say, uh, and give you that sort of critical proofreading uh, assistance. And remember, there's also the uh, your tutor uh, assistance offered through CQ, that you can have someone... Um, paid by the university to look at your work and I believe there's not much uptake on that so they're looking look, looking for the, some customers there. Alright, so your focus as, as a student reviewer is on that feedback and it's about understanding what is the core message that the person is trying to convey and whether they do that, whether they do that in a persuasive way, whether they do that backed up by good evidence and all those tasks that we've looked at throughout the term. So in terms of the draft itself, it doesn't have to be an absolutely final draft. You don't have to, and in fact it's better if it's not, because when, we, when we've finished a final draft, we're often quite reluctant to move things around or, or heaven help us to delete something that we've written. And I think it was O. Henry, the, story, the short story writer, who said the way to improve most stories is to cut the first page. Just cut the first page out of every story. And I found that from experience with, um, with student papers as well that often the first page of what we write isn't great. So if we become very attached to something as a penultimate draft, uh, often when someone says we need to make drastic cuts, it is much harder than if we show them a, a working version. Now, a working version does have to make sense, and of course there'll be gaps in there. So what I recommend is using square brackets to put in links in the text. So you've got this bit that's finished and this bit that's finished, and you put in a link in between that says, in this section I will link these two together by discussing the three principles in Smith's case. Right? So that gives them an idea of what you're doing, so it makes sense. They can potentially give you feedback on that... Um, on, on the stuff in, in, in the linking text because they might say, oh, I don't think you need to look at Smith's case here or that, you know, yes, you should, but you should also look at this. Um, and it gives you that 
the 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 stitching together of the parts that enables the the feedback the person giving feedback to uh, fully understand what it is you're doing. Um, what else in the draft? Uh, you can also ask questions in the draft too, as as I suggested you do in the. Um, plan task. So again I think square brackets are quite useful or if you're using Word you could use comments um, that can be a way of doing it as well uh, I think um, yeah Google Docs will do that as well but you can say to the reviewer um, have I covered this in enough depth should I put more of the facts of the case in here should I talk about the additional piece of legislation and that's fine that gives them an opportunity to know that there's something you're not sure about and to go okay yes or no is there too much in this section? Whatever. So think about feedback as a two-way process of communication. I know too often what we do, and the process of marking really reinforces this, is here's a totally finished thing, now you judge it. And that's not very useful. It's not very useful for you to learn. It's not very useful for the final product. And what we need to do in the professional world when we're getting feedback is to say, here's a thing that's a work in progress, now how can I improve that along the way? And that's really the nature of this activity here. The actual process itself um, is a matter of finding a partner who you can work with, and many of you already have a person in mind, I am sure, and, um, and swap work with them. If you end up with an odd number, say three people, you can just pass it along to the left. So everyone passes it, you know, the, the idea. So the easiest way is to just find someone who you're happy to swap with. If you don't have anyone you're happy to swap with, post something on the Moodle forums and say, I'm looking for someone to swap with and someone will probably get in touch with you. And at the end of the day, there's one person left over, we'll, we'll figure something out. And that'll probably involve um, getting someone is to, um, to do that pass around. Or someone might want to, might be happy to do more than one um, piece of feedback. I mean, it would be a nice public-spirited thing to do, to say, well, uh, you know, I'm happy to do two to pick up that extra one. And also, let's face it, the, the process of giving feedback, as I've said, is not a completely um, humanitarian sort of thing to do because you're learning a lot from doing it. And you probably learn about just as much by looking at someone else's approach to a problem that you're working on as you would just to, to going over your own work. Uh, you learn a lot more by seeing the way they've approached it, look at the way they think, look at the way they structure things, and you and the way they solve problems. Some things are similar to the way you do it, some will be different. So anyway, that's the process. Find a partner, swap your papers, give each other feedback, and give a copy of the feedback that you have written, not the feedback that you have received, into your portfolio. And that's the task for this week. Uh, on to the extra bits and pieces. The reading from this week is the Victoria Law Foundation Better Information Handbook, which is um, a rather a rather large piece of reading. Uh, I would advise you to skim through it this week, but to keep it at hand in the future as a guide to how to present legal information, particularly for uh, clients and organisations and lay customers. It's a great piece of work and it really focuses on those issues of how do you present complicated technical information in a way that is really succinct and accurate to an audience that needs to understand it. Um, so you don't need to know that one inside out and back to front. If you, if you do want to have a, a closer look at it, by all means, do that. Um, but I'm giving it to you as, as a, I think, as a, more as a resource going forward to have the things to think about. In the equilibrium section this week, we we look at a little bit more on the idea of feedback and resilience building, and that's an important thing as well, which we'll pick up on in one of the videos I do. That it's not just a matter of being good at giving feedback. There's actually a, a lot of skills involved in receiving feedback and using it effectively. Because none of us, none of us like to get critical feedback. We all love positive feedback, although some of us are, uh, I guess, uh, very sceptical uh, of of positive feedback. And someone says, "I love your work," and then you tend to um, uh, uh, maybe doubt um, whether whether the person tell us and telling you the truth about that. So not everyone is unproblematic about receiving praise, but we find it more difficult if something someone says, "Well." 
this is this is an issue I think you need to fix in your work and it's going to be an issue throughout your life and we tend to have again like most things very bad habits in how we deal with feedback which is quite often just going oh what would they know they're idiots they, they're, they're mean they just hate me or whatever which is very very seldom the case and usually it's just an, a, an easy excuse for us not to have to actually deal with this stuff and not to use the, the opportunity to build that resilience and to go you know what this person's actually spent some time and effort doing this for me, so the least I can do is actually get engaged with it sincerely. I don't have to agree with what they have to say, and I may and I may want to talk to them about it, but it's not just a case of just dismissing feedback out of hand. So particularly with your peer feedback process, it is very important that you're a gracious receiver of feedback because the other person is probably going to be a bit nervous about giving you that feedback, and if they found something where they're of critical in your work, they're going to be quite anxious that you're going to feel bad about them giving you that bad news. So the onus is actually more on the receiver of the feedback than the giver to make sure that relationship works and for you to be able to be an adult about it and say, okay, thanks, I've got a couple more questions, but let me think about that and let me let me see what how that um, improves my uh, practice going forward. All right, the only other section in the study guide this week is in the navigating the law section. There's an uh, area on primary research, which is something that ties into the thing, a lot of the study we've done in previous modules around um, uh, the use of data and the use of primary of, of other people's published research. There's a discussion in there about actually doing your own research, uh, doing things like surveys, interviews, ethnography case studies. Now, of course, as an undergraduate student, you won't have much of an opportunity to do any of this because it involves ethics clearance, and we've talked about the ethics context. However, many of you will be doing this subject with a view to picking up uh, an honours year later on, and it's worth thinking about those things now and starting to think about some of those methods going forward to thinking, well, if I was going to do uh, some research on a topic I enjoyed, would it be good to also learn how to do interviews? I mean, not client interviews, doing research interviews. What's the best way to do them? Uh, and to start considering those issues. So that's just included there as a bit of um, forward thinking, leading into next week, of course, which is all about forward thinking and uh, where we go from there. And, uh, and I know a few of you have spoken to me about honours. This is a time to start. I know if you're doing this, the course in sequence is the second year for you. There'll be a whole other year before you actually think about applying for honours. But it's worth thinking about that end point as you go through your third year and thinking about where is it you want to go because there's a lot of um, choice in the way in which you approach honours. A lot of it is about what you want to do rather than us delivering a program. All right, so this is, as I said at the start, the second last of our... Um, of our modules in legal research, and uh, and it's you know the very start of that lifelong process of being better about research and writing. We'll continue that theme next week, and uh, we'll move towards not only the conclusion of the term, but also the conclusion of your um, research paper, which will hopefully have been a, an opportunity to draw all these threads together. Mm -hmm.